Costa Mesa Sanitary District. Uh, roll call, please. Director Michael Schaefer. Here. Director Arthur Perry. Here. Secretary Arlene Schaefer. Here. Vice President Robert Uden. Here. President James Chairman. Present. Okay. Uh, public comments. Uh, we do have some uh, patrons here, and our Jim, what, are you up? Yes. Uh, th thank you, President Ferryman, members of the board. Uh, if you'll bear with me, I have several non-agenda comments. Uh, first one is that at your March board meeting, as you recall, you approved a $5,741 bonus for the general manager in lieu of giving him a pay raise, apparently with the idea that the bonus would not carry with it pension obligations. At that meeting, I questioned if this violated the California Constitution prohibition against government agencies in California giving retroactive compensation for services that had all been already been rendered, or if it was not for that, and since it carried no obligation for the general manager to continue working here, whether it was a gift of funds, both of those prohibited by the Constitution. District Council Burns pointed out several court cases, which he said made it now okay to provide bonuses of that sort for retention and recruitment purposes, despite the clear language in the Constitution that you shouldn't be able to do that. I actually went and read those cases, and they did not apply to this situation. They had to do with circumstances where there was uncertainty about the compensation of the public employee, like a negotiating group from the expiration of their contract to the start of the next one. And there was kind of a footnote about retention and recruitment bonuses maybe being OK, but it was not part of the case that was decided at that time. So I would again recommend, if you are wanting to make this a habit of trying to give compensation that does not carry pension obligations with it by giving bonuses, you should, con you should revise the employee contract so that it's clear, as the Constitution requires, both to the employee and, more importantly, to the public, what the formula will be for granting that bonus, what it's going to be based on, when it will be given, and what amount it might be. If you do that, I think there's no problem with that, but the way it was done I do not think was proper, and I don't think the cases that were cited supported it. Second thing, at the same meeting, you made a second gift of $50,000 to support the city of Costa Mesa homeless efforts, which is a very noble thing to do, but again, I questioned whether the, a special district of this kind, with all the restrictions on the money that it collects due to Proposition 218, actually has the discretion to support worthy causes that are not directly related to the ratepayers' property. Uh, again, I was told that the district has some money that is unrestricted, and I indeed went back and found an obscure file on the county assessor's website that tells me what the 1% on my property tax bill is being allocated for. And there is a tiny little allocation in there for what it says is the Costa Mesa Sanitary District General Fund. So my property in Newport Beach is paying into that fund. And I looked at some other properties uh, in Costa Mesa are not paying into that fund, including this property here. The fund does not seem to be related to trash collection or I'm not sure what it's related to. It says general fund. and. If a member of the public tries to trace where that money goes in our hopefully transparent district, it's not possible to do that because you look at our comprehensive annual financial report or popular annual financial report, it does not mention any general fund. And indeed, it appears reading between the lines of those, as the treasurer pointed out at your last meeting, that that allocation, my $4, other people's $4 kind of randomly at different properties in your wisdom have gone into the waste, into the, into the trash, the solid waste fund, which is an enterprise fund. So it's very complicated. I, I've given you money for a general fund. It's gone into this other fund. Then it's being allocated now. So we're providing sewer service for the homeless. 
apparently using our solid waste enterprise fund. So there's something, I think the district really needs to, it, in its interest of transparency, needs to rethink how it is reporting, what it gets, where it gets from, and what the restrictions are on it. The CAFR is very loose in saying we have millions of dollars of unrestricted money. I think most of it is highly restricted. And then if you will bear with me, the very final comment I wanted to make, in researching this, I was trying to figure out why some properties are assessed this, why some are not. So I went back and looked at the district's document back at the dates of its formation. And since this is the 75th anniversary of our district, I did notice the very first document is the formation of the district, which actually occurred on February 11th. That is the date that the Board of Supervisors declared as a result of an election that had been held three days before. Things worked really fast back then. Election was held on Tuesday. On Friday, February 11th, the Board of Supervisors created this district. I could not tell from that. It has a long legal description in it. So what I'm suggesting in recognition of our 75th anniversary, it might be good to actually put some of these milestones on our district website showing what the original district was. You cannot tell from the resolution what the boundary was at that time. And apparently it's changed over the years. And I think that would be a good thing to do in recognition of our anniversary. Thank you. And we should have had a cake because there was a study session on February 12th, the day after we should have had a birthday cake. Thank you. How do you know they didn't? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Uh, we'll have our, our attorney, Alan Burns, uh, look into this and uh, get back to you at a, a subsequent meeting. Jim, comment. Yeah. Scott, the uh, $50,000 we gave to the city um, has been characterized as a gift. I didn't particularly see that as a gift, but more, uh, uh, we, we, we pretty much had told the city that we wanted that 50000 to be used for renovation and construction of, of sanitary facilities at the new building. I, I, I'd like Alan to determine whether that's a gift from us or if that's, if that's the right word, okay? Gift, gift to me um, just has a different connotation. I don't, so could, you, could you have Alan yes. check yeah. that yes. vernacular, please? Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, we'll have, uh, have him give us a report on all, all that. Great. Thanks, Jim. Okay, let's move along. Any other public comments? Anybody have? Um, items of study, March 20th, 19, organic tonnage report. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I, items number one and two are your, your standard reports that we present to you every month, and we don't have any presentations. We're just available to answer some questions. You may have them. Okay, any questions uh, on that? Item three. Uh, two. Two? Yeah. Well, he said uh, one and two were clumped together. Oh, one and two, yeah. 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 March uh, tw uh, 2019, Code Enforcement Officer. Thank you, Mr. President. Ed Roberts will be giving this report. <clears throat> Uh, good morning, uh, President Freeman and members of the Coast Mesa Sanitary District Board. I'll try to poke my head above the podium here so you can see me. Uh, ladies and gentlemen. I can see your new haircut, so you're, uh, you're good. Yeah. Thank you, sir. <laughs> um, Ed Roberts, I'll be making the presentation of the Code Enforcement Officer Report for March 2019. Uh, during the course of the month of March, I conducted a series of seven proactive scavenging investigations through a proactive patrol throughout the community, uh, observed and detected several instances of scavenging. Um, for the benefit of the Board of Directors, there's a, um, a map and brief description of each scenario. And uh, nothing really of note. Uh, the Board, uh, from time to time, will ask me if there's any repeat offenders. Uh, during this last month, out of the ordinary, uh, two folks that seem to be creating a habit of it. Um, I'm dealing with that. They are uh, indigent in nature, homeless folks. Um, so I've had reach out to the uh, Costa Mesa uh, staff personnel in reference to what their situation is because their encampment is in proximity to the location that I uh, observed the scavenging. 
Um, are there any questions from the board of directors in reference to the scavenging enforcement? Please. Uh, Arlene. Yeah. I just had a comment um, on the College Park area. Yes, ma'am. If you could get the uh, CRNR to make sure that the lid goes back down, they're all up, you know. As you ride around, you see kind of hit and miss of the lids, and they should be just automatically going back to help people. So, yes, ma'am. Uh, I'll take a look at that for you. Okay, thank you. Certainly. Jim, Jim one quick question. Yeah. And, um, sure. The repeat offenders, I mean, these are folks, obviously, the homeless folks, um, you know, with the alley behind Pepper Tree. With, in the multifamily situations where they have bins instead of our carts, are you able to tell those people to stop or knowing you like I do, I'm sure you do, but are, are we allowed to enforce the people going into the, the, the yard things? <clears throat> Sir, off of the, uh, the verbiage of our ordinance, and our jurisdiction primarily falls on the single trash carts the cards. that we have. Um, by virtue of the way I do my patrol operations, uh, I will set up shop at one end of the alley and kind of just monitor the activity. Um, at, what's most effective for me is I wait till I can constitute a violation of our code, which is my purview and, and jurisdiction. So um, I'll just allow the individual to continue past the trash dumpster, uh, and, and if they do, you know, uh, open one of our carts, then it comes into my purview. Um, if there is a problem, we, we cooperate very well with city staff. City code enforcement has their proactive code enforcement program that they're doing. And I do have a phone number, uh, cell phone for the supervisor for Renee. Um, if it's a problematic individual or he's setting up a shop, for example, in an enclosure, I'll bring it to their attention and let them address it as they see fit. I appreciate that. Certainly. I have a question. Yes, sir. Is one of the repeat offenders on the Baker and Royal Palm Drive? Yes, sir. That's what I figured. Same person. Okay. Um, continuing with the report, uh, for the month March 2019, uh, through proactive patrols of the community, uh, 119 properties were identified as being in violation of our code for uh, trash carts uh, being left out in public view. Um, I've developed a, a group of uh, residents who have my cellular phone number they've got they're, they're interested in in their community's uh, appearance so they'll reach out to me directly sometimes uh, bypassing I'll, I'll let them know if they get an opportunity after calling me if they could formulate I'm sorry form a, a formal complaint so that way we can track um, what they're doing um, so I'm just being made aware of some of the folks that are again habitual um, so I, I've started to see a resurgence of a couple properties that have been identified as kind of repeat offenders the frequency is, you know, sporadic, but it's, you know, once every two months we'll see some sort of a violation. So I've uh, been working a couple of those properties that require a little bit more attention, but nothing really of note uh, to the board. Uh, there were no instances of graffiti. And uh, upon conclusion, there is a map at the rear of the uh, uh, packet for you that kind of charts the activity. Uh, of these scavengers. Um, I have, uh, I, I maintain copies of all my uh, presentations to you and you can see there's always been a shift and now it looks like it's spreading very equally throughout the community. Um, whereas the last few months we had it in the north end, now it seems like it's a 50-50 split between both sides. Any questions for me? It's good to speak just, for you. Yeah, just real quick. Certainly. For the first time in several years, Iowa Street resident is not on here. Yes. You know why? Why that's it. They sold their house and moved. <laughs> so the new resident is far more conscientious. Um, the other one is I have to pass on kudos to you because I think you've talked to Cheryl Towns on New Hampshire Street several times. Yes. She is a very happy camper right now and called me a couple of weeks ago to tell me how uh, efficient and how nice you were to her. <laughs> so. Uh, you portray us in the community to these folks that have an issue or a problem, and thank you for uh, for the attitude you take. Oh, sure but, but Cheryl is very happy with you, <laughs> so, <laughs> so thank you. Anything else from the board? Yeah, thanks, Ed. Very, very good report, as usual. Thank you all. It's appreciated. Okay.
Okay, let's Excuse move me. along to item four, food bank program. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, this item was requested by the board to bring back for discussion today. So staff has invited uh, CNR Environmental Services, which who are our, our partners with uh, Waste Not OC, on trying to help in hunger by in reducing food waste. So uh, I think I was going to turn it over to um, uh, Jeff Snow to do the introductions, and he's going to introduce uh, Mike Lyricos, the executive director for Waste Not OC, and he'll give you a presentation. Good morning, President Ferryman and directors of the Costa Mesa Sanitary District. I'm Jeff Snow, Vice President with CRNR Environmental Services and one of the longest serving advisory board members for Waste Not OC. My favorite job is being a dad, and while we struggle to, uh, are we going to do the PowerPoint? I have the PDF up there, and I can just navigate through it. Does, do one of you have the PowerPoint so she can load it up? Because. I'm pretty good at uh, keeping boards entertained while we take a <laughs> techno. So my favorite job is being a dad. So today's topic is food waste and finding the highest and best use for it. So I have some dad food waste jokes. If it's on your phone, we're probably not going to be able to get it to to Noelani. Mike, do you have it on a flash drive? Yeah. Okay. Then we'll just do the PDF. Take those posters down until it's appropriate to have them up. Just move them back. Mike, didn't you speak? My wife that? would agree that I'm far too handsome to have you cover up and obstruct me. <laughs> and thank you for the, for the press that's being what here. She said to me, well, that's <laughs> Okay, so food waste and dad jokes. Why did the tomato turn red? It saw the salad dressing. <laughs> <laughs> They're bought. Bob, it's time to write these down. Uh, I can't have to ask you to sit down here, I think. <laughs> what did the strawberry say to the flirtatious strawberry? If you weren't so fresh, we wouldn't be in this jam. <laughs> Thank you, uh, in particular, to Director Schaefer, uh, who saw this presentation at the Orange County Council of Governments in Costa Mesa a couple of months ago and for reaching out to invite us. We're primarily uh, an advocacy group for, so for, for the opportunity to get in front of people and share our story and share our purpose. Question, real quick. Who yes, did, Director who Perry. Present that to it in Costa Mesa. Orange County Council of Governments. It was last Friday. It was last week. Last Friday. At, uh, at Disney? Yeah. yeah. You did that again, Mike? Yes, that's true. Yeah. Did you get to ride the Pirates of the Caribbean? No. Uh, then I don't feel like I missed out on too much. And actually, four of us were there Friday, yeah. so. Yeah. Great presentation. Yeah, it was good. So does that mean we can just do dad jokes instead? No, just, <laughs> just go through it real quick. <laughs> okay, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Mike Lirakos. Mike is a... Uh, uh, great American, great Greek American. He is a restaurateur. His family uh, and, and himself have been in the restaurant business for uh, generations. He's currently the owner of the Catella Grill, uh, which is a fabulous uh, restaurant on Catella and State College? Main Street. Main Street. Catella and Main Street. Uh, great breakfast, uh, served around the clock. Breakfast is the most important meal of the day, so I eat it for all my meals throughout the day. Uh, it's frequented by the Angels, uh, Anaheim Angels organization. Uh, Mike and I met while serving on the uh, advisory board for Waste Not OC, and when we were successful in securing uh, funding from the County of Orange and were in a position to hire a full-time executive director, uh, Mike Lirakos was our unanimous choice. Uh, when I started with Waste Not OC three or four years ago, uh, we achieved one million pounds of food recovered and distributed to the food insecure for that particular year. We are now doing 1.5 million tons a month. So we have had meteoric uh, improvements in, in what we do. We still have a long way to go. So uh, please welcome uh, our partner, Mike Lirakos. Thank you very much, members of the board. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, since four of 
the five of you saw this presentation just a few days ago. I'm going to go pretty quick with it, but I want to explain what Waste Not OC is. Uh, it is a public, private, nonprofit uh, entity. It is an effort to end hunger through the recovery of uh, uh, excess edible food. And in doing so, we also uh, reduce food waste. So this is food that has, uh, is typically at end of life, meaning it's excess. We have nowhere to go with it. And typically, we've been throwing that product away for years. Uh, I'm a restaurant guy, as Jeff mentioned. And I apologize, we, did, we didn't need a plug, but I appreciate it very much. But um, for many years, we did not donate food because we were under the false assumption that the health department didn't allow it. And for many years, there was a fear of liability. Uh, fortunately, there's federal Good Samaritan laws that protect us, that hold us harmless for donation, or donation of, of uh, wholesome edible food as long as it's been handled correctly. Uh, so we found the biggest issue was actually brand protection. Uh, Large-scale donors, the Ducks, Disney, the Angels, hotel chains, restaurant chains, uh, their issue isn't necessarily liability. They know there's never been a successful prosecution of uh, foodborne uh, bacteria or an illness relating from donated food. What they're concerned with is their brand being protected. All of us who work with food make food for a reason, to serve people, not to get someone sick and certainly not to throw it in the trash. There we go. So again, we're a coalition. It's public, private, nonprofit. Each one has a role. On the public side, you'll see who we work with. The County of Orange, waste recycling, <clears throat> primarily environmental health. We were the first county in the country to use health inspectors to inform and educate operators about the ability to donate <clears throat> excess edible food. Um, <clears throat> We now have health inspectors not only going out in the routine inspection and informing, but also it is listed on the inspection report. So as I as an operator get my report, there will be a one paragraph on there explaining that there's a section of the California, California um, Food Handling Code that allows for donation of food. <clears throat> uh, then you'll see that we have uh, cities by nature of the grant, the county grant that we received, which was seed money to get this program going throughout the county, uh, we work with each city. And what we help each city do is implement a program through a uniform and uh, you know, a comprehensive program. We work with uh, Parks and Recreation Department because all these different events at public parks typically involve food. We work with building and planning because if I'm opening a, a business or a restaurant in a city, I need to submit my plans to the building department. It's a great way to educate about food waste diversion and food recovery. Uh, also upon the final completion of the building inspection, another opportunity to inform and educate. On the private side of it, we work with the trash hauling firms because there's a net benefit not only to the city but to the hauler. Also the food industry. The private sector is what drives this. We just step aside and let them do their thing. They want to donate food, first of all, and secondly, they have the time and the talent, the ability to help out in many ways, logistically, with technology, uh, with support, meaning uh, food recovery materials, cold storage, logistics, delivery services. Um, we really work with the, the private side of it. And then on the nonprofit area, every nonprofit that feeds people in Orange County is one of our partners. We do not compete with anyone. We augment what's already being done. So both Orange County food banks, all the various pantries, and the development of food recovery kitchens. Take the next slide. As you know, state legislation, what we call an unfunded mandate, the state passed legislation mandating a reduction in the amount of food waste that goes in the landfills. AB 1826 was the first one. It required cities and businesses to have a uh, food waste diversion plan. And then the next one, SB 1383, which is in the final steps of uh, uh, formulation of the, reg uh, of the regs, uh, that has a little bit more teeth into it. Quite honestly, that's the one we're all afraid of. That's the one that imposes fines and penalties for either businesses and municipalities who, are, who fail to reach that 50% uh, mandate. And Jeff, if, I'm, if you can jump in here and give a little bit more teeth, I'd appreciate it. You're the resident expert when it comes to state legislation. Okay. All right, let's go to the next slide, please. This is pretty much the way we work. We work with all these entities under that umbrella. So the healthcare providers, because we also identify people who are food insecure. 
you just talked about scavengers. Uh, those are the people I always thought were, were food insecure, hungry people. What I didn't realize is uh, recovered food only feeds 7% of the, of the population, which is homeless. The majority of it feeds children, seniors, and working families. Um, <clears throat> so it's not just the homeless population. It's people in our neighborhood who are working, productive people, but they live in an expensive part of the country. It's not cheap to live in Orange County. And many times, at the end of the month, they run short on, f on food money. So they end up uh, eating, either skipping meals or eating something that isn't healthy because it's all they can afford. So you'll find under here again, environmental health, food waste generators, reaching restaurants, hotels, grocery stores, jails, entertainment units or centers, uh, schools. Anybody that has a permit and is allowed to handle food is someone who's a waste generator. Uh, Health care providers, we work with all the various hospitals in Orange County, Chalk Hospital, Kaiser Permanente, the Family Resource Centers, asking, if we can go to the next slide, uh, two insecurity screening questions. These are the private industry partners. You're going to see a vast array of different types of entities from distributors, large-scale producers of food. You'll see up there, ironically, Cisco and U.S., the two largest food distribution companies in the country, Mortal Enemies in litigation three years ago, but they work collaboratively on the waste not model. You'll see small restaurants, you're going to see supermarket chains, and then you'll see ancillary support companies, Yellow Cab. Yellow Cab is one that we came up with. Um, they will run, they will shuttle food. They're just the wheels and the driver that transports food from point A to point B. We use them for schools where we don't have the ability to get the food to a central kitchen. Typically, that food that is not eaten by students at 1 o'clock goes to an after-school program, and that food is consumed at an after-school program close by. Let's go to the next slide. Public partners, as we mentioned, the county, the state, through CalRecycle. Uh, CalRecycle, as you know, is part of the Air Resources Board. Uh, they make me shake. They keep me up at night, to be quite honest with you. Um, <clears throat> but those are our, our state partners on the county side. Um, we mentioned some of those county agencies in every city and school district. Uh, just a quick correction, Cal Recycle is not part of the California Air Resources Board, but Cal Recycle is under jeopardy of having their authority uh, transferred to the Air Board if they are unsuccessful in implementing and enforcing all the current organics legislation. If every jurisdiction did what Costa Mesa Sanitary District has done, Cal Recycle would be considered the golden head s s s child, but not everybody is Costa Mesa Sanitary District. There are many cities who are obstinate about uh, getting their organics out of the landfill and finding higher and better uses. Um, so I just wanted to correct that. We, we believe, and Mike and I have been to many meetings together, Air Resource Board is sitting right next to Cal Recycle looking at them licking their, their lips, waiting for the day where they get to take over the regulation of this industry. I don't want that to happen. Our cities do not want that to happen. And we hope that Cal Recycle will continue to be our regula regulatory authority in the solid waste industry. Is Costa Mesa part of this partnership? The city of Costa Mesa? No. Thank you for clarifying. Appreciate it very much. Uh, let's go to the next slide then. Food and security partners, again, all of the nonprofits. You're going to see the two largest food banks. You're going to see uh, health care providers. Uh, you'll see pantries, nonprofit agencies that feed people. And then you're going to see a couple of uh, what we call Bracken's Kitchen right there. These are food recovery kitchens. And next slide, please. Uh, <clears throat> this is an example of the outreach that we provide uh, throughout the county. It's information for operators about food recovery. And this is basically the way it works in Orange County. Let's go to the next one. This is an example of what's on that, uh, the inspection form at restaurants right there. That's the paragraph we discussed. Uh, food recovery is a cost-effective tool in waste diversion. In other words, it is extremely expensive to remove food waste once it becomes waste. It's heavy, it's expensive, it has to be diverted in a certain way, and typically facilities are not close by. There's an added cost to it. The quickest, easiest, and best use of this food is to recover it while it's still edible and feed hungry people with it. 
This is an example of a benefit that we provide to municipalities and entities. It's the tracking information required to be compliant with SB 1383. Uh, we use Salesforce.org. We just completed a uh, platform to the cost of over $25,000 to be able to track all the shared outreach points. So as the cities will send out a letter to operators or food waste generators, the municipality, the um, uh, hauler, all these various touch points are captured by us. We have the, uh, again, the health department inspectors. We have industry representatives. Over 500 uh, food service salespeople in Southern California are out there talking to their uh, customers about uh, food recovery. We track all those various touch points. And then our own outreach people that go out there and work with them. That provides instant compliance with 1383 in terms of the outreach component. Let's go to the next one. As Jeff mentioned, uh, this is 2017 numbers, uh, 14 million pounds. Last year, uh, 2018, over 17 million pounds. And this is the, uh, the way that we re actually recover food. We're using technology to track where it's at. As a donor, you will hit donate, what type of food, how many pounds, and a suggestion of what type of vehicle is needed to recover that food. It now links that with an available pantry who can receive that food because they have space in their freezers or coolers or they're serving right away. It'll logistically match that through an algorithm with the pantry that's closest. And then the middle part, it will match it with a food runner, whether that's a volunteer who will sign up to deliver food or in, which has been trained by us and provided with equipment or it's going to be a food service uh, logistics operation that will use their refrigerated vehicles to transfer food. But that tech component, which right now we're using Chow Match, is the ability to match food and capture the amount of pounds tangibly. So, we also provide best practices. So we're working with not only food runners, but on the pantry side, these nonprofits who typically are short on staff, they work with volunteers, and they lack the expertise. We provide them with food safety training and the guidelines to handle food safely. Food safety is our number one priority. If anyone ever gets sick and when it comes to recovered food, it's a huge problem. Our focus and what has made us a national leader in this is using food safety as a primary concern. This is an example of modules that we have on our website. Anybody who wants to volunteer will, will go through these modules and then have to take a 25 question quiz and get 23 questions right in order to be able to be a food runner, authorized food runner. Donation receipts, as we mentioned, the ability to track all this product, it's a huge advantage for a food waste generator. They're going to pay more. The reality is someone's paying for this. They're going to pay more. I pay more to have my food waste removed. Anything I can do in terms of a donation for donating or for a deduction for donating food uh, that I would have to end up diverting or throwing away uh, in another few days is a huge advantage. And then the last part of this component is the ability to repurpose this food. We found that we could recover it, but basically we were just trading dumpsters. What we needed was the ability to repurpose bulk food, take these donations and either rework it into something completely different or repackage it to extend the shelf life. Yes, sir. Mike, uh, ultimately, uh, would, the waste food, would, would the waste go to CRNR uh, and their facility in Paris, which handles organics a as well as tree trimmings and, and that kind of thing? Yes, yes. The, the, your, your waste hauler is responsible for removing the, and diverting that food waste. The highest and best use for our food resource is to feed people. We should not feed machines in Paris when there's hungry people and the food is edible and wholesome. So CRNR is in a formal and full partnership with Waste Not OC to use the wholesome, edible portion of surplus food to feed people. The next resort and lower on the highest and best uh, would be to recover the energy and nutrients at the ROAR facility. And if you haven't heard that term, we have named it ROAR, Regional Organics Anaerobic Recovery. Uh, and as you know, you are uh, our original partner. Uh, from what I understand, you signed up off of blueprints and your vision in partnering with this is incredible. 
Uh, I don't know what your rate is, Scott knows, but I now have massive demand from cities that we don't even, that CRNR doesn't even service. Your Belinda is a Republic city. They are offering me 119.50 a ton to get capacity. We don't have it. We built it for CRNR's customers, not for other people's customers. And SB 1383 is interesting. In three short years, 2022, residential food waste recycling will be required statewide. There's only one solution in the state that can take green waste and food waste co-collected, and that is ROAR, and that is your solution. What does that mean? Every other city is going to get a fourth cart. If they have a three-cart program, trash, recycle, green, they're going to get a yellow food waste cart. They're going to have to have four trucks come down the street upsetting public works because a trash truck does 20,000 times the wear and tear that a passenger vehicle does. Public safety is not going to be real excited because trash trucks are dangerous around children. And do you think that a hauler is going to be able to just put a whole other pass in, into a program and, and not have to pass through the costs of it? Mm -hmm. The investment that you made in whatever it was, a couple dollars per month per home, to get a co-collected highest and best solution, it's going to cost other cities 7 or $8 by 2022. I cannot tell you how incredible your vision was. But I digress. We're on food recovery today. Yes, Director Uten. Um, I would think one of the selling points for this would be uh, the 2020 regulations for uh, pounds per capita diversion. Um, I think the city of Costa Mesa is close. And I'd like your data from a previous presentation on, yeah. um, on that topic. Um, but I would think... Um, the cities are all, the cities and the sanitary districts or whoever collects trash or is responsible for reporting to the state, um, all are going to be in a bind to meet those 2020 regulations. Director, I don't believe any city will be in as much of a bind in Orange County as Costa Mesa because SB 1383 requires such onerous detailed reporting by the pound. Which restaurant or supermarket donated, how many pounds, what was the temperature, who is their hauler, how are you going to track that with multiple haulers? Exactly. exactly. Waste Not OC, exactly right. Waste Not OC offers an absolute turnkey through their technology. Everything goes through the app, everything is summarized, and they give one nice, neat report to the city, which will provide full compliance. And they'll do it in Costa Mesa for less than $20,000 a year. Do you have a suggested hauler? <laughs> do we have a suggested what? Uh, hauler. Suggested hauler. For the city of Costa Mesa. He's setting you up. Don't, don't, don't Thank answer you, director. this question. Jim, I've got, a couple, I've got like three or four questions. Hey, Mike, at your presentation, you listed four partnerships with haulers in Costa Mesa, or in it was CNR, Republican Waste Manager. What was the fourth one? Uh, EDCO, which operates, EDCO operates in um, Buena Park. There's so they're the fourth Orange County Hall. Are that operated Costa Mesa besides uh, CNR, Republic Waste Management, or EDCO? Yes, there's 17 haulers. But they're not, but they're not uh, partnerships with you, right? No, we went to the four major haulers that had contracts with cities. Okay, good. I got a couple more questions. Uh, do we donate, um, or do you donate any food to the recovery kitchens in Costa Mesa? That's a great question. Uh, actually, we're developing a rec another recovery kitchen, which is Orange Coast College. They're building a $45 million facility that's going to house their culinary program. They've set aside in that plan space in one of those three kitchens just for food rec recovery and repurposing. The culinary students at Orange Coast College will repurpose that food, make it available for pantries in Costa Mesa. We'll also use area high schools as a feeder program to go into that culinary program. Are there any after-school programs in Costa Mesa that we donate to, that the city donates to? Yes, there are. Um, and I don't know the names of them off the top of my head. I apologize, but there are. And, and typically it's because logistically we always look for that closest uh, donor. 
Is there any way we can find out the total tonnage that is donated in one year? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Close to the Coast Mesa. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a. <laughs> we could add that. That's where the cost comes into. It's it's Not detailed. We could add that to our total of tonnage recovered. Mm -hmm. But um, so you answered all my questions, I think. D Director Perry, we have been funded by the County of Orange. Rare five zero votes from the Board of Supervisors the last three years. We have another time to the trough on May seventh. If any of you can come to the Board of Supervisors meeting and speak in support of it, that'd be wonderful. But Supervisor Andrew Doe is on our advisory board, and he has challenged us. He said, Jeff, Mike, the cities are the one benefiting from this. The cities are the one, ones that have to comply. The cities need to start partnering directly. That's where we're coming from. And the cost is so, so remarkable. The entire city of Costa Mesa, how many population? 160,000 people, 116,000 people, we will end hunger in this city and divert material from landfills where it creates methane pollution for less than $20,000 a year and provide all these reports. So we will likely get a 5-0 vote again this year to keep us afloat, but we've got to become sustainable and funding on our own. Uh, and we need help with that. I just have one last thing. We're the lowest amount. That we, we pay the lowest to CRNR for the program that we have. It's around 70, $71, which is compared to the 119 that you're going to be collecting soon. Mm -hmm. So we're the lowest as of today. You, you guys have the most smoking deal ever. Yeah. Yep. Are you ready for questions, Mike? Or I had you, a question. No, that's fine. Go right ahead. Please do. Go ahead, oh. Ma'am. Uh, on the school districts, are you in with Newport Mesa Unified School District at all? Okay, so we have with us, we're very lucky, we have as our outreach coordinator a former Orange Unified School District board trustee. So this can you explain where we're at with schools? <laughs> <laughs> so I was part of the Orange Unified School District uh -huh. and helped set up this program so that we're recovering food out of OUSD and then bringing it and serving it um, within our community. Um, I know that in Anaheim, they're actually recovering food and then they're getting it to the afternoon school programs because often that's the last meal that some of these kids eat. Sure. And so in Costa Mesa, our, we're currently working, correct? And so we are recovering food from every school district. We're working across the county right now to get every school district involved so that everything that's recovered past the cafeteria food table that isn't, be, that isn't eaten can then be repurposed. And that can be repurposed in any manner that the school district sees fit. In other words, if they want us to give that food to, or to the students and the families, there's something called McKinley, McKinley Vento students. And these are identified families that struggle with uh, food insecurity. And so we're working on creating a database to reach those students and then give feedback as to how many we're reaching and what percentage we're reaching within any given community. And that can be in Costa Mesa or Newport Unified as well. Thank you. Thank you. And this is Tim Surridge. Uh, and you think about this. We have so many schools on free lunch programs. What does that mean? That means taxpayers are buying the lunch. The kids don't eat the food, and we throw it in the dumpster so that we can charge taxpayers even more to pick up the trash and bring it to a landfill where it creates pollution. What is wrong with us? This is not brilliant stuff that we're doing. It's just common sense solutions. Let's take that food. Let's set up a share table to start with so that the kids can bring it home because they may not have nutrition at home. And then let's have Yellow Cab come by because they're bonded and certified. Uber can't do that. Yellow Cab will come and pick up the surplus that's not taken from the share table and we'll bring it to a recovery kitchen where we can prolong the life or we'll bring it directly to share ourselves or Southwest community, somewhere where we can get it to hungry people. This is, again, not brilliant, but it's the right thing to do everywhere. And even at 7150, which you guys are not paying me anywhere near enough. Uh, no, no, just don't go that far. 
<laughs> the, the, the cost that we're proposing to cities is $30 a ton. So we're saving, it, this, this is the biggest no-brainer, and uh, we know everybody will get there, but we have yet to have one city come forward and say, we want the solution for our city, and we'll do our part to fund it. And, there's, and, and you could do it through commercial rates, lots of ways to do it, but this city is going to be in the biggest trouble of them all, because you're going to have 17 commercial haulers and multiple food agencies and, uh, you know, for less than $20,000 a year, we hope that the Costa Mesa City Council or we hope that the Costa Mesa Sanitary District will explore ways to do the right thing, to get the food out of the landfills and to feed hungry people, save the planet and end hunger at the same time. Uh, but we do need partnerships. Have you done this presentation to the City Council? We have not. Are you planning on doing, doing that? Okay. I'll, I'll defer to my full-time Waste Not OC partners. I think we need to make this an agenda item. Yeah, I would appreciate that. We'd love to. Yeah. We'd love to. Yeah. I think that's on Scott's task this year as part of his Wonderful. evaluation. Well, we have an opportunity, Freddie. We, once a quarter, the liaison. we have a liaison committee, which is the city and the three districts, the school district, the water district, and as we meet quarterly to discuss topics of interest. We have a meeting this Friday, and I, I think this is something we need to put on our agenda for Friday, yeah. is to get the word out that you guys need to visit with these people. But um, mm -hmm. I, I, couple, go ahead, Her. No, I, 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 and we need to probably have a meeting independently with the city. I, so, and yeah. talk about the, the 17 haulers. I thought it was 12, but it might be 17 well, haulers. Well, there's 17. 17 haulers, but there's only really about six or eight that are active. 17 potential haulers. I think that's what the ordinance calls. Seventeen allowed. Right. right. Six or eight. Well, we we would appreciate any help with that. And and the reality is, for example, Mammy mentioned the school districts. Everybody is participating, but we're early on with it. So there's plenty of room to accelerate the program uh, throughout. Again, it's a comprehensive uh, approach through the school districts, with the city, with you. There's a way of getting everybody on board. A couple, couple quick questions. Or Certainly. Uh, one of the th I look at this food insecurity partners slide, and to me, what really stands out is: Have you talked to Shannon at Someone Cares Soup Kitchen? Oh yes, uh huh. Is, are they part of the program? They are, they are recipients. They are part of the program. Every nonprofit that feeds people is part of the program. Capacity and what role they can play is always the issue. I, I, I think that's probably where I'm going with that: is how much capacity does Shannon accept? I mean, they do pretty aggressive fundraising job here in Costa Mesa. I mean, um, I know personally how much money, I, I, I know her pretty well. They focus very heavily on raising funds to purchase product to make their, their food. Um, if you guys could help them, I, I just that, that just bothers me that they're... They get some every day. Yeah, I, I understand that. Um, in terms... A couple of times, Mike, you mentioned brand protection. Mm -hmm. Is that a liability thing where, say, some food manufacturer, if I'm using the right term, doesn't want their name on there that's going out to someone else from a liability issue? Or is that just to keep no. them? No, it's not necessarily a liability issue. The brand is, uh, issue uh, arises in three areas. One, it's going to be uh, should someone get sick, should something happen. Right. Right. Uh, we use the example of the angels when we first approached them at the program they jumped on it and they came back a couple weeks later and they go no we can't afford for a homeless guy in the riverbed to get sick on a hot dog with an angel's wrapper uh you know the media will skewer us it'll you know we're trying to do the right thing but more importantly a lot of companies have built their brand on a regional name so they would prefer that that product not get out there in other words they don't want people to know they're they're donating because now more people will hit them up or it shows some kind of a deficiency in their operation. So many times donors would want to be anonymous. That's how they protect their brand. And then other times they want that food to go out of the market, out of the area. Okay. So there's okay. brand protection I, comes in different forms. Speaking of insurance agent, I always look yeah. at the worst case scenario. But yeah. um, the last thing I had is you talked about the fines that municipalities are going to start having to pay and 2023, mm -hmm. 2025, uh, that's under 1383. Correct. Scott, 
or if you guys know the answer, if if the requirements aren't met and the city of Costa Mesa has to start has to start paying those fines, that doesn't fall back to us at all, does it? No. We're not going to get fined. It's it's ultimately up to the city to comply with those regulations. That's a pretty big selling point. It is. To get it the is. Cities involved. And I think there's a bigger selling point, and that is. Uh, fines and penalties are one thing, but the fear of litigation is another one. If we are not compliant, then you know there are groups that are going to come and uh, come after the various entities. And they'll take the shotgun approach. They'll go after everybody. Okay. Thank you. Uh, on the brand protection, uh, Director Schaefer, a member of our advisory board is Dr. Al Baruti. He is the VP of food safety for the Cheesecake Factory chain. So we have... Uh, a level of expertise that's governing our approach that's second to none. Uh, Mike and, and uh, operations, uh, I believe we're the only food recovery coalition that's taking the temperature of all of our food and tracking the time. And time and temperature are the two dashboard monitors for keeping food safe. Uh, we know it won't be through our model that somebody gets sick. We keep our food safe. We keep it nutritious. And, you know, this has been going on for years. We've all seen people in the dumpster feeding themselves. We're just doing it in a way that brings respect and dignity to human beings. And we're accelerating the, the results in an exponential way. Thank you. We should probably go ahead and move on here. But uh, great information. Uh, one final question, and that is, there's so many uh, programs involved with each other in this coordination thing. Do you meet uh, on a regular basis to make sure every all the all the bases are getting covered? I mean, uh, yeah, that's a really good question. And I, if I can just give you one example, we always explain what our role is. Each one of these entities that work with for, on feeding hungry people. They're, we equate them as classically trained musicians, um, but if you go to a symphony an hour before and they're all playing their instrument, it sounds terrible. We provide the sheet of music and we are the conductor. So yes, it's ongoing. It isn't periodic. It's ongoing. We look at that balance that's required to be effective. For example, we're going to provide refrigeration equipment to a pantry. We're going to provide a, a software for a food bank or a tractor trailer to second harvest so that they can pick up at all the Costco stores. We work together to augment what they do, and it takes constant collaboration. Okay. You know, I, I really, I'm sorry, Jeff, just I, I'll give this to staff, I think. I really think we need to make a huge effort to get to the city. Uh, I don't know what it's going to take, whether it's going to take meetings with some of us and you and I understand they're, you know, they're trying to get a new city manager on board, um, but this, this is huge. I mean, I think not just from the, it's huge not from the just the humanitarian standpoint, but we're all elected officials in charge of protecting the the interest of a bunch of people, and if the city has to start paying these fines, and they can't get cooperation amongst their various haulers, I think we need to take something and push them. And, and it, Scott, I really think we need to reach out to the city and say, hey, we need to sit down and get serious. We've talked about it for years at liaison meetings. Hey, guys, you know, these regulations are coming up, and the attitude from the city has been, eh, we'll handle that when it gets here. That's nonsense. So whatever we can do, and, and you know how I feel about it. So, we can, you have one final question? Yes, I do. Do you think that you have some kind of bullet points that you can give to Scott so we could have – he could make a presentation Friday about this, you know, just bullet points of, on a, Absolutely. you know, that would that. be meaningful that they would understand from this. Because there's, liaisons is water district, it's um, a school district, it's us, a city, so we all come together. And it's really worth it to be able to, you know, have, be a leader in that and us to explain it. Scott. Yeah. We can and will end hunger. Orange County will be the first county in the United States of America to declare an end to hunger. It's very exciting. We have a 62 million meal gap. 
We're now at 15 million meals a year, so we've got a ways to go, but we still have 2 million tons of food going into our landfills. So the resources are there, the simple model is there that works, and we appreciate your support, and we do know there's actions you can take to support this initiative. The, uh, your agency can put out a position statement, you can promote it on your website, even though you don't have direct jurisdiction over the commercial uh, sector. There are things that you can do and we ask you to explore those and uh, I'm going to detour because you never know when you're going to get run over by a truck or win the lottery. Uh, my experience this past year helping to represent CRNR has been incredible. I pinch myself every morning that I'm part of this team and I work with over 50 different municipalities. I want you to know that your staff, Scott Carroll, Noelani, Gina, Nabila, you have world-class people that are a cut above most city staff members that I work with. They are incredible. We have one of the most robust economies that this nation has ever experienced. CRNR just lost one of our stars yesterday, David Latham, who has been overseeing operations here. It's hard to keep great people right now. So I encourage you to look at your staff's compensation programs and everything else because they're winners and you don't want to lose them. That was probably inappropriate, President Berryman, but I might win the lottery tomorrow. We, didn't, we had nothing to do with that. So he's put, yeah, you set this up. Not only is he pushing for more money for CRNR, now he's pushing for you guys. I mean, come on. All right, thank you very much. I appreciate the thank time. You, I, I just want to add one last thing. The Waste Not OC model is being adopted by the state of Mississippi, by jurisdictions all around the country, uh, and you can be very proud that it started here in Orange County. Thank you, Mike. Uh, <clears throat> let's move along. Uh, CRNR customer price index increase request. Thank you, Mr. Mr. President. So uh, Nabila Guzman is going to be giving this report. This is regarding uh, CRNR's request for consumer price index increase in the, in the rates. Good morning, President Ferryman, members of the board. Per our 2018 CRNR agreement, CRNR can come every two years and request a CPI increase. We received their CPI increase uh, for the next two years in, on March 29th. They are asking for a 5.8 CPI increase for the next two years, so it would be effective July 1st, 2019, and it would go through June 30th, 2021, 2020. Is, is, that, is that each year? Uh, it's 5.8 for the next two years. So it's about a one-time increase. Mm -hmm. Well, every two years they can come back with a one-time increase. Uh, at this time, we are asking that you direct our district treasurer, Mr. Mark Davis, to audit the profit margin for CRNR for the Costa Mesa Sanitary District. During negotiations, they did ask that those reports not become public record. So Mr. Mark Davis would need to go and revise all uh, the information at CRNR facilities. The actual request for a CPI increase will not come to the board for action until the June 20, uh, the June 29th board meeting, I believe, or 27. 27th board meeting. And that is because in the May board meeting, we have a public hearing for a rate increase, and it is ill-advised that the board as adopt or grant a CPI increase before residents have the opportunity to protest the rate increase. I am available for any questions. Any questions, yes. Bob? Um, the, the indexes that, that are being used, uh, were those decided by the contract? Uh, yes, that was decided during negotiations because our budget is a two-year budget. It was decided to use a 24-month CPI increase instead of a 12-month CPI I mean, increase. Particular LA, Anaheim. Yeah. Yes, it is the same one that is used for staff CPI increase. To make it easier for budget purposes, we decided to use the same. Well, um, I guess I would have a suggestion that since it's a two-year increase, maybe we do or consider part of it one year and part of it the next, rather than a one-time increase. 
And these indices are generally lag two years in um, in the data that's that is presented. So the the actual last two years C, C, COP uh, consumer price index was two percent and three percent, and I forget which year. Th this is basically data from three years. Three years. I hold up four fingers. Just three years ago. Um, the data for this year, the data for last year and the year before won't be available. You know, they'll come due two years after after, after the actual fact. Um, you know, I think it's inappropriate uh, to give this large a percentage increase in light of the fact that we're having uh, uh, trash rate increases. You know, I'm getting a lot of feedback from my neighborhood association, next door neighbor, whatever they call it. You know, and they, they basically quote 33.2%, which is the cumulative potential increases uh, over the next five years. And you know, I, and I tell them on there, you know, that's actually 1.2, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a minimum of the dollar 20 per year. Which, when I came on the board, you know, Gary Monaghan said that's less than a. We, we had a, a sewer rate increase at that time, and they said that's less than a couple's latte. That doesn't seem to cut it. Thirty-three percent is the number that you know the dissenters or activists or whomever are focusing on. Um, so if I, if we can mellow this out a little bit, um, we're actually looking at. Uh, a $400,000 increase, part of it is this five point whatever percent it is, uh, increase in, in costs for next year. And uh, I, I, for one, as a citizen and two, as a board member, uh, think those that, that type of cost increase is not going to be covered by our 4%. 7%, 7%, 7%, and 6% increases. Um, so I'm not in favor of uh, the whole increase being in, in one year. This is the first uh, increase to CRNR rates in over 10 years. Um, we're not talking about history. We're talking about this year. Yeah, so when the item comes to the board in June, you will have options of either granting a no CPI increase, a uh, half a percent increase or the 5.8 so the board will have the chance to s kind of discuss and see what's appropriate and what they wish to grant a question Jim. And Mike. you know what when I looked over the statistics and maybe mark if you if this is going to be directed at you when I looked at the CPI all urban indexes which goes back to 2007 the highest number I could see was like 4.2 or 4.3 if they're asking for a 5.8, does that mean they've increased, their costs have increased above the CPI? Is, is that how I should look at it? Or maybe you'll know that once you get in and look at their their books, so to speak. I, I, I'm confused. Is that directed to Mark or? That's whoever can answer my, <laughs> my inane question. <laughs> I'll take a stab at that. The. Um, uh, the 5.8 percent increase that's being requested was based upon uh, looking at the um, the most recent CPI factor, then going back 24 months and looking at what the factor was at that point in time, and looking at the difference and the growth over those that 24 month period, not a two year block, but a, but a monthly block uh, that's published every month. A uh, monthly block over that 24 month period was 5.8 percent. Uh, I think what um, staff is asking then and what's in the contract is that um, uh, part of this, whether or not CR&R would be eligible for an increase would be dependent upon whether their profit margin, uh, when we take a look at their profit margin, whether that supports that, that increase, meaning that we'll come back, we'll take a look at whatever they can show us to demonstrate that their uh, costs have exceeded that uh, amount, then they could be eligible for up to that at your discretion. For up to that. So we could say, we we don't like the 5.8, but we see based on this, we can give you a 
a 2.1. So that's we have that room. That's correct. Okay. And we'll have that opportunity uh, if, it, if it turns out that way. I, I believe staff's going to bring it back at the time the the budget adoption. Yes. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Um, let's move along to uh, item six. So, Mr. President, if I if I could just some clarification, the recommendation is to authorize dis district treasurer to review CNR's profit margin with respect to service provided the district. Are you authorizing district treasurer to do that? I would I say yes. I would, I I you just authorize them to look at the books. That's yes. all we're asking. Yeah. For. Okay. I just need some clarification. That's, that's where I'm coming from. I think you need a vote. On, do you need a vote on that? It's appropriate. Yeah. That would that would be nice to have it up for the record. I'll move that we authorize the treasurer to to make the um, the study of the CRNR second the books. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, can I have one of your cards? I will, I will send you information. I'm an environmentalist. I don't like to kill trees. <laughs> well, does, does Scott have your contact information? Uh, yeah, I might have an extra card for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, item six. Consider one of the four alternative designs yeah. for the project of 318 President Pump Station Reconstruction. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, before I'm gonna, ha I'll have uh, uh, Rob. If we if we bring the, we bring the boards back to for your view in here in a second, and I'll have uh, while, while staff does that, Rob will go into details again about the, the four designs. Uh, before he does that, I would do like to brief the board on what we on our efforts for uh, community outreach. Uh, as you might recall, when we first presented this uh, these options to the board, uh, the board directed staff to reach out to the neighborhoods to to get some feedback. Uh, if there's any specific uh, desires uh, or specific designs they prefer in, the, in their neighborhood. And so we first reached out to the neighborhood on March 2nd where, where we uh, were out actually in the, at the cul-de-sac there uh, to uh, meet with the neighbors to share the, the design, the four options, and then actually really walk the site to ask, answer questions. Uh, unfortunately, that day was one of the very rainy, wet day. Uh, uh, so we think the, the weather might have had something to do with the very low turnout. We had one resident that, that did uh, show up and that we talked to and, and did receive some, some good information. We then presented the, the four options to our Citizens Advisory Committee, and that was uh, on um, later in the month. And so uh, Rob gave a very detailed description of all four plans. It was a very well uh, I, I believe a very well engaged meeting. The, the CEC members asked a lot of good questions. Uh, in the end, uh, they did recommend alternative number two uh, because it's within our budget. Um, as you'll hear from Rob, uh, there are some some um, some studies or some some studies we have to do on on that design specifically the testing of the. Uh, uh, concrete, uh, the, the uh, concrete in the, the dry wall, the dry wet well, the, or the dry um, vault, uh, to ensure that that's stable enough. If not, um, then the CEC recommended alternative number three. So going back to the neighborhood, because we did receive, uh, because there was only one person that showed up, uh, we, we again we were really concerned, or we really wanted to engage with the residents on these options. So the next step we took was uh, we mailed. Uh, photo simulations uh, to 24 uh, property owners um, on uh, President Place, and the photo simulations showed where the proposed electrical panel will be located in the right of way. We also gave them on, as you see, on the designs there on Alternative Four. We gave a, uh, that uh, photo simulations to, to the residents, and we asked them. We gave them a, a survey. We asked them, "Do you prefer the pump station in the cul-de-sac, or do you prefer it in the original easement?" And, and included in their survey, survey was a uh, prepaid uh, self-addressed uh, envelope, so there was no cost to the residents. All they had to do was check one box and mail it to back to us. Of the uh, 24 um, residents we contacted, we received eight surveys were returned to us, which is about 33% return ratio. Of those eight surveys, five were against the um, proposal in the cul-de-sac. Um, three were in favor in the cul-de-sac. 
And so that's just a little brief overview of the outreach we done or we conducted with um, the residents on President Place. So now I'm going to turn it over to Rob, and he's going to uh, go in more details on the alternatives. And then what staff is recommending today is to um, kind of give us an idea of which alternative you're leaning on, and then we'll bring this back on your April board meeting for um, uh, final uh, consideration. Thank you, Mr. President and board members. <clears throat> We've been here a number of times to discuss the four options. Scott gave a very good presentation on what the CAC had to say and what the neighborhood had to say. We also have one property owner here, Dane Bauer, who wishes to speak today. And he owns the property where the pump station is currently located. And if we reconstruct then in the easement, then we would be considering either options one, two, or three, but not four. Four is out in the cul-de-sac. So not only do you have Mr. Bauer here, we have our maintenance super, superintendent, Steve Cano, and we have our pump station specialist, Tony Gomez here, who would also like to speak. I would be happy to review anything in the staff report prior to them speaking, but maybe you want to hear them first before I go back and give a summary. Uh, I think you've probably read the staff report. I can give whatever level of detail you wish. I do suggest you allow the speakers to speak first, though. And then I'll come back and we'll go over some details. Okay. Uh, can I bother you for your, did you fill out the green? You know, I came here mostly, um, I've, been, I've been working with Rob for the past about eight months or so. I bought the property back in June mm -hmm. um, with the understanding of the easement and the construction of the pump station with a little bit of brief history on the pump station. I'm primarily here uh, to learn uh, about the four uh, options. Rob's done a pretty good job of working with me and, and kind of keeping me up to speed. Um, the option, there is an option down um, where the pump station is located currently that would into my property. So I would like to um, just publicly say I'd like to protect that um, option from, from you know, my perspective. I'd like, if there's a possibility to not protect into my property, to consider the alternative options. Yeah. That's what I'm here for. Um, also, <clears throat> the, the current station is it's an older station from my understanding, so there is smell from time to time that builds onto my property. Um, high flow uh, happens typically on the weekends at night, and it sometimes reaches even into my front yard. Um, so whatever option we choose um, to do a, a good job of, of using all the current new technologies to manage the smell of life. The reason I, I purchased the property, my fiance and I, was because we, we found the neighborhood, we loved the neighborhood, loved the people in it. And there's quite a bit of value, I think, uh, in West Side Costa Mesa. And so I think we should do whatever it takes to kind of secure that value. Because for the years to come, the property values in this neighborhood are going to keep going up. That means more property tax for the, the city. Um, and so I would just <coughs> publicly want to say, let's, let's do the right thing for the neighborhood for the safety of uh, the um, maintenance personnel, uh, for any emergencies that could happen in the future. Um, and Are you favoring any any one alternative <laughs> at all? Or when, when I spoke with Rob, so I, I mailed in my letter, um, and mine was uh, the, the, the cold side option. And that was um, for a couple of reasons. One, I felt like it would give a better access for uh, maintenance, um, for cleaning, for an emergency to happen, easier access for the city to get to. Um, and I felt like 
construction back in the, the canyon um, would be difficult. Um, safety, uh, cost, um, and uh, for access for people getting in and out of the canyon, which is, uh, you, get, you know, people going in and out of there daily, they love the canyon, it's, it's such an amazing place. And so to keep that open for the public use during construction also, from what I spoke to Rob, the uh, cul-de-sac option would take significantly less time to build, um, which is uh, positive in my mind. Um, and uh, I, I believe those are the, the main reasons. Uh, yeah. uh, Rob, do you want to comment uh, on? Yes, thank you. I, I would be happy to answer some of those concerns. With regard to with regard to imposing on Mr. Bauer's property, the first of all, all the proposals in front of you are staying within our easement. What Mr. Bauer is really referring to is that if we fit any of the no, I should say options one and three. Thank you. One and three do, do expand our footprint out there to the limits of our easement. So right now, this is option two. There's the pump station right there, that square. And this is Mr. Bauer's wall his wall, and that's the limits of our easement. So we will be with option one, we are removing his part of his wall. Option three, we are removing part of his wall right here. Option two, we haven't finished design on this, but we may find out we want to be over here even though we're over here. But if we're going to keep this less expensive, we'll probably be where we are. So we might not have to remove his wall. But we did put money in the budget to do that. We also have to trim the trees. The trees really overhang from Mr. Bower's property and the property over here. It's a canopy over the top. And we are going to have to buzz saw down one this easement line and buzz saw trees off on that side so uh, that's what mr. Bauer is referring to as to being on his property we would just be further onto his property the property owner up here we're, we would be further onto his property too but his property is up the slope and up here so he would never even notice the difference between that and this for being a little further up the slope. I'm sorry, just real quick. Uh, the residence property is on the left of the of our Mr. Easement. Bauer's property is right here. Oh, this one. Yes, and this is this is the <coughs> driveway easement that goes to the back, and right. that's where our current pump station is. So this is Mr. Bauer's property right here. Where's the wall you're referring to? The walls will be... Okay, so here's what's out there right now. Just this rectangular area with the pump station all in one. <coughs> so where would the walls be? This would be a retaining wall. Okay, so when we... And this would be a retaining... Excuse me. When we look at these drawings, we're looking from the back out towards president. That's correct. Okay, I'm sorry, I had it. I and, and, it was the and this is the edge of the park. Thank you. And this is the pedestrian access. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Okay. And, real, real quick. Sure. I, and when I, with, I think it's an arborist, right, that works with trees? Yes. Um, buzz sawing that big of a tree does, I mean, the tree is going to end up collapsing in front of my property. So. It's not just a simple buzzsaw. It's going to take, it's going to be, you know, you're going to have to do something with the entire tree. It's a, it's a giant tree. I don't know how tall, but. 
Uh, right. Uh, as the trees are right now, they would interfere with construction. Uh, we have to have a crane in there. Is that, are those ficus trees? I don't think so. Okay. And then to address Mr. Bauer's concern about odor, we don't really have any odor control equipment out there. And the proposed station will, has one measure designed into it, and it has another measure designed into it that can also be put into play. And we do have updates in technology and all. And I'm pretty confident we can take care of the odor in the future as part of the project. We did put that in the design and in the budget. So uh, that's an answer to his questions, unless you have any more questions about his <coughs> comments. Anybody have a question? Well, I don't have a question, but I would like to compliment Mr. Bauer on you know, his assessment. Uh, when the food safety people were here, they said safety was their biggest concern. And in this project, um, <coughs> safety should be our biggest concern. And the, and the safety would be impinged on when the construction is being done. It's a cramped site. Uh, you can't get many pieces of equipment back up that alley to construct any, any one of the three alternatives that are back up in, in the thing. So the, 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 the building site offers tremendous concerns. Uh, there's an overhead power line back there that was going to limit the, the, uh, the, the construction activities, the contractor's construction activities. The maintenance, you know, in the middle of the night, if there's an emergency, um, any, one of our, any one of our people that are on duty have to be able to probably back down that alley. Although there's, you know, there, there is a detention time, um, you know, probably six or eight hours. I don't believe all of our maintenance staff can back that equipment down that so-called alleyway. Um, so you know, the emergency response is going to be more difficult. We've had at least two and maybe one major sanitary sewer overflow from that station. We are going to get a new station no matter you know, which of the alternatives are there. And there probably is enhanced emergency equipment. but. Um, I saw our Vactor truck, and, and it was the biggest one of the two, come out of a filling station this morning. It's like an 18-wheeler. It's probably easier to back down that alley than an 18-wheeler. There is a smaller Vactor truck, you know, which would be half the capacity, um, which I don't think necessarily would be the favorable alternative, just because it's smaller, it has half the capacity of the bigger one, and that's the one that we can get in there, and so we would try to deal with the emergency with, with that small piece of equipment, smaller piece of equipment, partly because the bigger one is more difficult to get in there. Um, so I think from a safety standpoint, I don't think there's anything more paramount to this agency than to try to be safe or to make facilities that are safe. Um, the employees, the public, the residents, all of those things should be, the safety should be the first criteria. The emergency response is probably the second criteria. Uh, you know, I think we have the modern means of dealing with odor control, but safety and emergency response, in my mind, is what dictates us imposing on the three neighbors that voted against, or five neighbors that voted against the cul-de-sac option, they probably weren't aware of the safety and the emergency response aspects of, uh, that was not included in, in the card that they checked the box. But they want, what, what they were responding to was, it is gonna be an impact for four months to build the safe the cul-de-sac option, it's going to be an impact on them for six months if we build one of those alternatives back in the alley. 
And I don't think they realize there, there is not much room there and there's only one piece of contractor equipment could go down that alley and probably do the construction at a time, big piece of equipment. The rest of them are going to be parked out in the cul-de-sac, you know, waiting their turn or deployed there. Uh, you know, I, I, I think it's a no-brainer to, <laughs> uh, to put safety and emergency response at the top of this of the, these criteria to, to rebuild that pump station. That pump station will be there for the next 30 years. It won't be noticeable once the four or five month construction period is done. Um, anyway. Thank you. Uh, that was very well spoken. If I may give a couple of comments and then we'll have uh, Steve Cano and Tony Gomez speak. Uh, before you get there, Arlene had a question. Yeah, no, I just, that's what I was gonna ask if they could speak. Okay, I, I just wanted to reiterate what Director Uden said. There are, there is a power pole right here. And the power lines go this way. And all the contractors wanted us to move the emergency storage vault away from this side because the power lines are overhead and I'll refer to the crane again. The crane, we have to have a crane back there to install everything. And the crane is gonna be as high as the power lines. We did meet with Edison a number of times. The power lines are gonna stay from here to here, and then there is one line from here to here, and that is a safety concern, no doubt about it. And the other thing about backing a truck down, and once you have one truck down there, where's the rest of them go? Uh, that is a true statement. So uh, those were very important items that Director Uten brought up. So maybe now, Mr. Tony Gomez or Mr. Cano? Here's your Tony. Good morning. Um, yeah, my name is Steve Cano, I'm a wastewater superintendent, and Tony Gomez is a SCADA technician. Um, we have a couple concerns about moving the cul-de-sac out into the cul-de-sac. Um, for us, safety is also our number one priority. Um, by saying that, when we do maintenance on our pump stations, we have wells that are open, vaults that are also open. With the high footage of traffic that goes through there, um, you know, you get your looky-loos. So there's that safe, right, the precaution right there. And also, my crew, if they have to answer questions with residents, you know, hey, what are you guys doing? It'll distract my guys and, you know, Accidents do happen. Also, um, for emergency, if we do have to respond, you know, we do green <laughs> trucks, and being in a cul-de-sac, there's not a lot of parking there anyways. Um, so we'll be taking up a lot of spots, possibly blocking residents' driveways, which will be aggravating. Um, also, just doing regular maintenance, we're there at least once a week. So, you know, we have our trucks there, and when we do the annual, it's more thorough, so we bring more trucks. Also, and then we clean the wells, so we bring our vac trucks there too. So that whole cul-de-sac will be pretty full with trucks. Uh, also, if we, if we move the wet well to the cul-de-sac, the panel will be kind of far from what we usually like them. Um, usually we try to keep our pumps to the panels maybe within, what, 50 feet for the cable. Um, if we go longer than that, we have to start using a junction box where that can cause issues too for the power. These junction boxes will be um, susceptible to corrosion. Also, moisture can get into the power cables, start messing up our power cables operating in the pumps. Um, Tony, he's there more than me, so I'll let him also do his concerns. Good morning, my name is Tony. Well, um, the concerns I have is practically what Steve mentioned. 
Uh, there will be a lot of traffic while we're doing maintenance, obstructing the main uh, driveways for three residents. Uh, there's no room for all trucks to, to fit in that area. So we'll have one truck at a time, and that one truck alone would, in, um, would basically allow, uh, not allow people to come in and out. So uh, I understand your, your wife is a nurse, and sometimes she's on call. So she needs to leave right away. And if that happened to be an emergency or while we perform ma maintenance, our trucks would not be able to move out of the way immediately. It would take time because the crane truck has a leg. They have to be set up for, for, uh, for the weight. So that way the suspension would not get affected. And just removing all that stuff would take maybe at least 45 minutes. So also, uh, Scott mentioned that they visited the area while it was raining. There was a lot of water going in there. There's, there's a, actually a uh, storm drain. Most of the water flows in the side of that cul-de-sac, and it's kind of like a small river. So if we do perform maintenance during rain, that would affect whatever we're doing. Do you have a question, sir? I was talking, trying to talk to somebody. I thought some uh, people were standing outside looking to come into the meeting. Okay. <laughs> well, do, if you guys have any more questions for us. Oh, I do. Uh, you, you said there's probably some safety dangers from Looky Loos. Uh, you, you set up barricades for your staff to uh, do whatever they have to do in, in, the, uh, in the well. The wet well. And so that would prevent, that, that makes the public Looky Loos you know, have to keep their distance. Right. And if there's special circumstances at a, at a particular pump station, you just have to make your barricades big enough, you know, to keep them away from the dangers. You're right. And, and those are standard procedures that I'm sure you use at all the pump stations. Um, I, I asked for um, a video of how you maintain pump stations, like the Abelmore pump station. That's in a cul-de-sac. Um, I believe that you would do your maintenance probably at a, at a, at a time during the day when it, it would be least impact. You, you work you work during the day normally, right? Um, so I, I would think that uh, the, the impacts to neighbors there will be some um, if the if the station ends up getting built in the cul-de-sac, um, but but I think. It's hard for me to envision your truck being bigger than that pump station and totally blocking the intersection. Well, every time I visit the pump station, there's several cars there. Yeah. Um, I, 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 and I'm sure you guys noticed that I drive a utility truck. It's a small pickup truck. It's not as huge as the other trucks. Now, where I do park, it's it's sometimes next next to. Uh, next to the station, which is the driveway uh, the next to, uh, if I can show you guys, so you have that vision. Here on the cul-de-sac, this is basically the same size of a pickup. There's always a car here. There's always cars in this area like this too. So I can park here because I'm obstructing the entrance in and out of there. I usually park here. So if I come in, with the crane truck, I will have to park here on this area. As you can see, it will be minimum space between here and there coming in and out. Not necessarily blocking the driveway, but blocking the entrance into the cul-de-sac. Now, if we bring several trucks, so we have to have one truck here and maybe another truck here. That alone will block everything. So um, the main concern is these three driveways. If those three driveways we may be uh, able to mention or advise when we come in, you know, so that way they can park their cars outside. But other things, like for instance, the rain, this water flow here goes up to this level, and it goes over the the uh, the uh, the sidewalk. So it's it's a heavy, heavy, heavy rain that comes all the way over here to the storm drain. That's also a safety concern. If you step over into that water, that might even pull you because it's such a short current. Uh, those are the number of concerns that we have. Um, you mentioned bringing trucks in here. 
the only truck that mainly will be bringing and sign most of the time will be the pickup truck or the crane truck. Um, the way that station is going to be built, we're going to try to maintain the pump station with the pumps and try to use the back truck as much as possible. Such as, you know, California, you, you're familiar with that, how often we clean it and we try to minimize the problems and concerns to people. Any more questions? So how often would you need to visit the station for maintenance? Uh, at least once a year. Oh. At least once a year, and that's not counting emergencies. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Rob, do you have any recommendation uh, keeping in mind security first and, uh, you know, functionality and, and all of I mean, uh, what's your gut feel on this? And, and with your, all the years of experience you've had, uh, I, for one, am going to place a lot of my, my judgment on what you have to say. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and thank you. Everyone had a great opinion. These are four engineered designs, and they all work very well. Director. I believe in Director Uten's comments that uh, safety during construction and emergency response. Uh, I think that during construction, one of the re one contractor told me it would take him six months because of the limited access back there to construct one vault at a time, kind of, because there's not enough room back there to get trucks here, there, and everywhere. And I find that backing a large vector truck to get to the pump station, that, that is not a proper way to access a pump station. So unfortunately for the maintenance crew, I still believe in the cul-de-sac option because it's right there for them. I think that it actually makes their life easier. But it does put it right in front of everybody, and there's odor control. But from a safety standpoint and emergency response, the cul-de-sac option works the best. However, uh, we as engineers can make any of these four designs work, and because that's what we do. Well, so, if I, if I may. About the cost of, of uh, that one. Well, well before you, before you, if you, one thing we're not talking about is the enclosure and where that's going to be located. Can you remind the board where that would be located in the cul-de-sac? Thank how, you. And how big that enclosure is going to be? Uh, Tony was correct that all the water comes down this side, and it's a lot of water. Actually, Director Uten and I met with the city yesterday. And they call this a hot spot because water goes beyond the right-of-way onto private property. And the city may come back and put another catch basin along here and tie it to that storm drain, and then it would be underground, and that would greatly reduce the flows in this area. So. One of the reasons we put the emergency storage vault over here was because it wouldn't get in the way of parking. But we cannot put it there after what we learned from the what we learned from this, the residents about the amount of water here. That would have to go on this side, which can be done, but it's just another. It's, it, it's another challenge we would have to meet. So this could prob probably be moved over here, and then this pipe here would go that way. You also talk about the electrical enclosure and how, how there are some existing utilities that could impact that as well. Thank you. There is a water line underground here. So we would be putting our electrical panel on top of a Mesa Water District water line. And they may not want us to do that. 
However, it's an electrical item. It's not getting wastewater too close to potable water because there are state regulations on that. So the electrical enclosure would go right here and this would be striped no parking to allow Tony and Steve and the rest of everybody to put a parking space to be able to pull up and do their weekly checks on runtime, etc. So uh, that's that. Those are my thoughts. And, and one last, what, what's the, the what's the dimension for that electrical enclosure with the antenna on top of it? I just want the board to be aware that there's going to be an, a, a, an enclosure in front of someone's property. We're going to put in if you if you approve that that location. I can speak to that because I have an enclosure on my property. Um, that antenna goes up 15 feet? Yes, at least. And that enclosure is probably 3 by 10 or more? No, nah, maybe not. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, let me just say that ha that enclosure, the enclosure is growing these days. We are working on the canyon pump station and to take everything that is outside the enclosure now and, and building an enclosure long enough to put everything that's outside on the inside, we are 12 and a half feet long. Currently, we don't have an enclosure that's longer than eight feet. The canyon enclosure is going to be four and a half feet longer. Like I said, it's growing. The enclosure here would, though, be close enough to the wet well to take care of what Steve said about being only having 50 feet of cable. Uh, the cable would be from the pumps up and go underground over to here. And like I said at the previous meeting, the, one of the limitations or drawbacks of this design is the odor control. If, if it's not perfect, we're going to get a complaint. And I do think that no matter what, at some point we're going to get a complaint. Even if we put every, uh, unless we go with a, a contained atmosphere, which is a, a little more expense. But those are the limitations. Those are the drawbacks on this design. Large electrical enclosure, very high antenna. The antenna back here has got to be 20 feet high. So a 20 foot high antenna with a large enclosure there. Water coming down this side, this would have to be over there. Uh, the odor control is a, is a battle. But as Director Uten said, Safety in construction and emergency response, this is number one. But at some point, I will, do, I will say this. If this is unlikable for some reason, and then we want to talk about these three, if we, if we go with the number one plan that went out to bid, we need to put into the project over $800,000 more to build this. This one can probably almost be built with the money we have. This requires additional money too. Let me go back here where my finance information is. So with, I'll just run right through it. With number one, we need $815,000 additional. Number two, less, we need less than $30,000 to build that. Thank you. Number three, we need $600,000 for that design. And number four, we need another $400,000 in the budget. So we would be from 30,000 to 
$815,000 additional needed for this project, and that's above the $2 million that's already in there. So I'm not happy about, number one, costing us a total project amount of approximately $2.8 million. So uh, the, those, there are limitations, drawbacks for each design. There are benefits to each design. That is correct. This would be the, our biggest chance to steer clear of Mr. Bauer's property. And that one's also um, the closest to the budget. Correct. And so what are the benefits of one and three if two um, you know, has those two positives to it? Two, uh, item, uh, number two is the one that requires the structural analysis. That is put it, it's included in the budget. I'm sorry, the question was what? So there's three options for uh, the construction of the compensation where it is now. Right. Why is one and three preferable to two, given that two is closest to the budget and it also um, does not protrude into the easement on the property? The reason, the reason is we don't have any existing plans of the concrete structure that we are going to reuse as part of option two. So we have to do a structural analysis of it, which includes uh, kind of a, a sonar type thing to see through the concrete and find out the amount of steel. And we have to analyze it. Then we're going to have to go in and cut some walls out and put some beams and columns in. That's why it is, that's the limitations of number two. Isn't number two also provide us with the smallest emergency storage vault? Uh, it's, it's, it's actually very close. They're all very close. Okay. And I don't think any of the designs have problems with downtime. They all they all will be able to have two hours of downtime during peak flow, which is uh, the standard in the industry. Arlene has a question. Yeah, I do. Um, out of all these plans, are, are there any plans for uh, variances or encroachments of any type? Very good. We, of course, would need a, a permit from the city to dig up in the public right-of-way, whereas the other three, were, the only thing we would be doing in public right-of-way would be fixing the driveway and sidewalk where you would leave President Cul-de-sac and go into the easement. There's no real, there, there's nothing that we would have to gain a discretionary approval because we're trying to shortcut something. So there's really no variance or no problems per se that we haven't already addressed. We have to make the sidewalk work for ADA. Uh, we have that figured out uh, for if we do option four. I think maybe uh, you want to hear from your general manager as well. Uh, he's, I think he's now a sewer expert as well. So his, uh, I think his opinion should be considered as well. Didn't you say four is, we're not going to do four? Or you, uh, you what I'm saying is, is that uh, the CAC, Citizens Advisory Committee, against it. Okay. The neighborhood, against it. Our own maintenance crew, against it. The CAC said, before we tell you which one we like, we recommend to the board that you do not select okay. the cul-de-sac. Okay. But you go back to what uh, Director Uten said about 
safety, and emergency response. I myself waffle back and forth between these designs. I kind of feel that if we're not going to put it in the cul-de-sac, we should start with op option two, because that's the least expensive, the smallest footprint, it's the easiest to construct, and at, at least we're starting with the lowest cost. If we start with the highest cost and then run into trouble, we'll be over three million dollars, which we we put the Irvine pump station in in the street for two million dollars. I don't want to spend three million dollars to put it one or three. I'd rather start with the least expensive one, prove that the vault is okay, and then use this design, and it would satisfy, I think that would satisfy everybody. What would, what would it cost to do the analysis of that number two? Uh, less than 25,000. Okay. We could actually do that now, and then come back and make a decision. If, the, if you want it in the back, in the easement, and the structure turns out to be no good, then you're back to one or three. But you could do, you could do the analysis first and then come back and make a decision, or make a decision and say, Rob, go design it, but do the analysis first. And we would do the analysis first as a first item of work and not do anything after that until we prove that it is structurally sound. So I think, I, I think design two kind of meets everyone's acceptance. Is two the one that you said we have to talk to the water district about if we're going to go over? No, that was in the cul-de-sac. Okay, good. Thank you. So if you, uh, if you, CAC pick number two, and I like item option two, it's the least expensive. So if after all that you say, uh, let's help everyone who voted against the cul-de-sac. My recommendation would be option two. Uh, do, 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 you need a, do you need direction on getting that analysis done? I think it's an important. I think we need to know what that well, well is. It's in the budget. It, it, uh, item two said, or option two said, we need to fund an additional thirty thousand hopefully, and we, that would mean our budget would be 2030000 which is the lowest it could be. I think that data is important to make the decision. Mm -hmm. yeah, agreed. But I don't favor one or three, so down to the Is that two. a motion? Yeah, I make a motion that you, you get that analysis done ASAP so that the next time we address this process, Second. You need that analysis to, you know, to, to, to know whether you can even use that, that station or not. That is correct. Okay, we've got a, we've got a motion and a second. Just a quick question. Any further discussion? Yeah, just real quick. We had planned on bringing this item back to next week's board meeting. We won't. Is that off the table? If you direct uh, Rob to do that analysis, we will not bring this back until the analysis is complete, and they will so, share that with and you. And there's no, I mean, we're, we've been, looking at this for quite some time, so delaying it an extra month or two is not going to nope. break anybody's back, right? Nope. Would you like to hear our general manager's recommendation? Yeah. Yes. I think I already know it, but yeah, I'd like well, to hear it. Yeah. I, I, I would concur with, with Rob and the CAC on alternative number two. I think the, the, the CAC did a fabulous job of really engaging with Rob and asking a lot of good questions about all four alternatives, uh, and they were... I was very, I was impressed with their, with their this conversation, and they went with alternative number two, and then alternative number three as the second option if the analysis doesn't come back as we hope for. 
my my recommendation is what the CAC is recommending is go with alternative two as your number one choice and if the analysis doesn't uh, work out then we go to alternative number three and, and we could make this as a just a discussion and bring back that to the board meeting if you want that was what it says on the agenda was for discussion and direction but I suppose that the analysis of this, uh, Scott has the authority for, I believe, that amount of money, and we could do that. I, so. I agree with Bob. Yeah, I I'd like to see it before we do yeah. anything. Yeah. Right, what are you saying? That, that we, we should he agrees with Director Uten that the, the study should be done yeah. immediately. Yeah. Going further First. with anything. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, how long will the analysis take? How about a month? I mean, it's only it's only thirty thousand, and it's in the budget. Yeah, Mark and I were just talking about okay, it, how that would impact. The oh, because we would be right if you decide to go to number one. See, right now the budget is prepared with putting the eight hundred thousand into this the extra 800,000 right so we would amend the we'd have to amend the budget and because what the general manager saying is if we wait 30 days the budget will be too far along to change mm. well that doesn't make a difference if we go with a, with a least a less costly alternative that just means we don't spend the money that's correct we have money left over yeah is that doable? Okay. Yes, we have projects lined up for the next two years. And if it turns out we go with option two and have the extra money, we have projects that could use the money. Engineers can figure out a way to spend that money. I did have that problem one time. The finance director said, Bob, give me a project for 800000 So we put another sewer line in Victoria Street. <laughs> OK. Uh, any other questions? Uh, I'm calling for the question. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Um, I, I think we're doing the right thing, and hopefully it's going to I agree. come out. It, this is a, a, a very good step-by-step -step approach. And Mr. Bauer will be getting married in another week. And Steve and Tony know that, and they're going to wash down the station and lots of this and that. It's your marriage? Yeah, in our backyard. But it's you being getting married? Yes. Oh, I thought it was yeah. your daughter or something. No. You're not old enough to have a daughter that old. <laughs> <laughs> they have a great view of the pump station. <laughs> yeah. Congratulations. Okay. It's not too, it's not too, late. It's not too late to talk to you about this marriage yeah. thing. You're, you're okay with it? <laughs> So our plan is to be there for 30 plus years too, so uh, we want to make sure that you know, whatever he decides to let yeah. him do for us and more keep the family and take Good day. Well, You heard what we had to say mm -hmm. and uh, safety first. Yeah. And that's, mm -hmm. that's where it's at. So. And, and, you know, when, when, when Tony and Steve spoke, uh, you know, about Blocking the cul de sac that caught my attention too. So, you know, whatever the decision is, just, you know. Right. I, I, so listen, I, we will work with you, and, and we, but we do want your input all, all on the way. My last comment is that I believe that option two takes the pressure off everyone because it's very hard for the guys to have 100% odor control, 100% not blocking driveways. The noise, the backup, ding, 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 uh, and people scrutinizing their work. So I, I do support the field crews. Thank you, Rob, for your, your input on this, too. It was very yeah. valuable to me. OK, let's move along. Uh, construction inspection program. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Um, Rob, if I can have you sit in the audience on this item. Uh, yeah. That, that'd be great. Thank you. So, thank you, uh, Mr. President, Board of Directors. So, as you may recall, back on uh, February 12th, uh, Rob Hamer submitted a proposal to the board 
to reinstate his firm to be the, the district's construction inspections, uh, inspection services. However, uh, as you know, there was concerns with uh, district council and myself regarding prevailing wages, and, and the board directed um, Rob to go back and review um, the prevailing wage requirements and resubmit um, a revised proposal, which he has done, and it is attached uh, to your staff report. Uh, what staff is proposing is really a, a hybrid approach that we believe it will be a win-win for both uh, the district and for um, uh, Robert Hamers and, and Associates. And to kind of the, to, to briefly go over that uh, approach, right now we have uh, a private firm pro providing uh, inspection services to us, it's Anderson Pena, and they're uh, responsible for inspecting private development uh, as well as public work projects. And public works projects is basically any project that's using public funds. Uh, it could be RCIP projects, it could be some uh, our, our minor public works projects, it could be um, the City Costa Mesa's uh, manhole raising projects, it could be uh, Irvine Ranch Water District, you know, maybe they're, they're doing a, a sewer project or a water line project that's next to our sewer main and we have to just go on there and inspect it. Anything that has public money is considered a public works, works project. So right now, Anderson Pena is, is providing that service for us at $125 an hour, which is well above the current preventing wage rate for construction inspection at, at just under $75 an hour. Uh, because uh, this is uh, a preventing wage um, job, the, 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 the inspections, um, Anderson Pena is required to uh, register with the California Department of Industrial Relations, uh, otherwise as we know as PWC 100 form, uh, which when you do that, they give you um, uh, an ID number and then you, the, the contractors use that ID number to reference their certified payroll that they have to submit to the state to, to ensure that they're, they're uh, paying prevailing wage. So Anderson Pena does that right now. What, um, um, in Rob's proposal, uh, he does mention um, his private development's um, uh, hourly rate at $65 an hour. And as, as, as because it's private development, it does not require, um, Rob does not have to um, file uh, the PWC form um, because it is private uh, development, does not require uh, public funding. What um, the hybrid approach would look like is uh, Rob would be responsible for all private development, okay, at the $65 an hour. And then um, for the public works projects, uh, my recommendation is that we enter a contract with the County of Orange Public Works Department to provide uh, inspection service on the public works projects. Now, we did approach OCSD as our first choice to do this. Uh, unfortunately, they just don't have the capacity. In fact, they're hiring out um, private inspectors as well because they have so much work. So that was our first choice. I didn't want to let you know. So we actually, so then we reached out to the county, and the county says, yes, we can do that for you. And they gave us, uh, which is attached in your staff report, their hourly inspection, the fully burden hourly inspection rate, which is $97.62, which is immediate savings to, to $125 an hour. So my recommendation is, is that uh, we uh, enter a contract with the county of, of, of public works, and I foresee that to be at least for one year, because during that one year, uh, we, that, that inspector along with Rob's um, uh, institutional knowledge would pass on to um, our engineering technician, uh, Balvon, who has expressed interest of being our, our district's inspector. In fact, he's currently doing, going to training right now. He's just completed courses at uh, Santiago Canyon College on a public works certification on emphasizing for inspections. He's uh, um, going to webinars for the American Public Works Association on inspection service. So he's, he is getting that, that skills required for inspections. And then along with him um, getting training from Rob and from the county, I believe within one year, he can become that, that inspector. As you see in your staff report, and you'll hear later uh, this afternoon, we did a, um, a salary compensation uh, survey from a consultant of all our positions. <laughs> And that consultant is recommending uh, that the engineering technician could uh, take on that responsibility of inspection services 
and that position will be um, re reclassified as engineering technician slash construction inspector. And as you see in the staff report, the fully burden rate for that would be around $57 an hour, which is basically half of what we're currently paying right now for public works projects. So the recommendation is, uh, uh, again, that hybrid approach where, where Rob would do the private development inspections, um, the county would do our public works inspections for about a year, and then the district would take over on that in inspection services uh, from then on. And then when the inspector, our inspector, when bows on vacation or on leave for sick leave or vacation, then Rob could be that alternate um, inspector for us, and he would charge us the uh, prevailing range rate of $98 an hour. Uh, the total cost is, is very minimal. Uh, the total cost, if we go with uh, uh, the county for one year, um, estimating about $98,000 it would cost us, uh, and, and that's assuming uh, 1,000 hours a year of inspections for public works projects. And then for uh, Rob Hamer's, uh, I'm ex uh, we're estimating about $58,000, $59,000 uh, for, for private development. To hire um, or to reclassify um, the engineering technician to engineering technician slash construction inspector, the additional cost will only be about $3,500. Uh, also, the good news about this, I know previously we talked about this, there was a possibility we'd have to hire an additional body. So we'd have an inspector and an engineering technician. With this hybrid proposal, we don't have to hire an additional body because BAO can do both those services of a, an engineering technician along with um, inspection services. Um, there are some additional one-time expenses. Uh, I do recommend we um, purchase another vehicle, like another hybrid or um, a, um, uh, a Volt or, or Ford Focus, I think I've had in there um, as an electric vehicle for $53,000. I also recommend um, um, uh, the uh, wireless tablet um, that uh, can be used out in the field so he can uh, maintain his inspection logs. So that's about $2,700. Another $6,000 for a vehicle charger. So those are all one-time expenses. Um, so um, that is what I'm recommending today. There's uh, actually, if you, on your staff report, there's about five recommendations for you to consider. Uh, you don't have to consider those today, um, but if you like that, the direction we're going to, then staff recommends you bring this back, we'll bring this back to you for the 25th, April 25th, for your consideration. I did share this hybrid approach with Rob. Um, we've had that comment, Rob does support, and I can have Rob comment on this. Rob supports the hybrid approach. Um, so um, happy to answer any questions or have any questions for Rob, we're, we're available to, to answer those questions. So I'll conclude my presentation. <laughs> How, how it's different from what we're doing now is, is an advantage for us. Thank you, Mr. President and board members. That was a very good presentation by our general manager. And I'm a team player, so I will always do what's best for the team. And I think that uh, Scott's approach is brilliant in that it's the best for the district, which means the best for all of us. I do like Bao Vong, and who would, as you heard, would be the CMSD employee who would be working towards construction inspector. I've worked with him since he started here, and I, we do training twice a month for an hour or so, and he does have a mechanical engineering degree. Uh, he may end up being a registered engineer, but he's a good man, and I support the growth of his position and his knowledge. I think it's very important to uh, this consideration. So I'm not going to stand up here and say, give it all to me. I'm going to say, it sounds like what's best for everyone is Scott's hybrid approach, so I am in support of it. Any questions or comments? Bob? Uh, so so you, you would provide personnel that would fill in uh, when Bob wasn't available? Right. Uh, we would actually have, we would have a part-time inspector to inspect the private development and also 
provide backup for Bell. So it, it would be, we're, we're splitting the pie somewhere near a half, and then each side could pick up from the other side if there was a problem. The succession plan that Scott outlined said in, in a year, Bell would be capable of doing the inspecting. Um, how much time of Bell's would that require? Bell seems to think that in his current schedule, he can get everything done, if that's what your question is. You mean with, with the time that he, that he has the time to do all of this? Yes, to do his plan reviews. And he works with, I'm part of, he and I constitute the plan check team. And he, he has his role in that. Maybe it could be done sooner than a year. I'm not sure of Bao's uh, where he is in his programs. Uh, I've already always encouraged him to go out with our current Anderson Panda inspector, Dave Rao. I've encouraged Bao to go out there, and I've met Bao out at a number of uh, job sites already. Uh, I think he could be ready sooner than a year. I think Scott picked a year. I don't think Orange County Public Works would accept a six months contract or something. But if you were to say, let's do it as fast as possible, send Bow out now with Dave, get some training, and not hire the county. Just turn Bow loose now, because uh, okay. I, I could back him up, okay. et cetera. Any other questions? Do I hear we need a motion? So I, I'm not hearing the objections, so if it's okay with the board, I'll put these recommendations back on the on the 25th for, for okay, consideration. Okay. Is this a consent calendar item, or are you going to put it on the regular agenda? Excuse me? Are you going to put it on the regular agenda or the consent calendar? I'll put it on the regular agenda. Unless you want a consent, I'll put it on the regular agenda. I'm just curious. Yeah. So it would be May of 2019, not May of... 2020. Just kidding. Oh, okay. You know, uh, I've I've got to uh, I've got to leave this meeting. Okay. So I don't know if uh, I have to go also. So maybe we ought to postpone the classification compensation. Study. That's fine. The the actually the consultant that was supposed to be here to give that study got caught up in traffic, so we were going to have him come back at the uh, oh. April board meeting. So maybe that works out fine. Okay. We could do that. Sure. Right. So. I think it's complicated enough that we probably do need a study session item. Is, is, just is, just is, for that. Is, is there a budget con constraint? It, it is tied in the budget. That's why we were trying to get it. We can give you we can give you a quick thirty thousand level type um, overview of it, and then you know if you have some detailed questions that we can ask, we can answer. We can always refer to the consultant next week. Okay. okay. You want to do that, or do you want, or we could just wait and just do the whole thing in one, at one shot at the at the board meeting next What's week. The, I'd rather. Well, we do it at the board. I, I think it's going to take longer than to. I, 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 so. I agree with Art. I think it's going to take some good discussion. Diana's put together a pretty good report. It's pretty comprehensive. I, I think it's going to take more than a quick okay. board meeting. I, can, you, can you move it to the May to the May study session? Mm -hmm. Is there time for that? Uh, well, I'll refer to my phone. What do you think? Two eighteen. I could quickly go over right what? now, and then maybe you could. Think of questions to bring to the board meeting. Caitlin, what do you think? Can, if you go to the main, it'll be okay. Can we it's tough because he has guys to leave. You know, that's going to be tough because we're, we're, we're planning to present the, um, the budget to the CEC meet in, in May, in mid May. Um, yeah, if, if we can't do it today, we, we'd like to do it on the board meeting and get some direction from the board okay, in the board meeting. Okay, let's do that. Okay. okay. I think we can do that. By, the, by that time, we'll have time, more time to think okay. about it. Yeah, we, I, we would like to give, present it to you next week. Okay, then oral communications and director comments. Uh, anybody have anything real quick? Just real quick. Thank you for getting me a retirement program, Diana. I got my confirmation letter from CalPERS, so I guess I'm in the, the program. Thank you for your help. Well, that'll be $81. Uh, you know what? It's better than what I'm getting now. <laughs> okay, uh, I believe that's all we have. Uh, so I'm going to call this meeting adjourned. Thank you. That was nice.